while I was writing this piece, I was reading this story or this book. Thank you so much, by Mandy Baca that I quote in um, the piece, it, the sizzling and history. The <laughs> the sizzling history of Miami cuisine. And she's a local, born and bred Miamian food historian. And she writes about from the Tequesta Indians, you know, up to pretty much present day. And there's so many interesting things that we used to eat and grow in South Florida. And I encourage everyone to take a drive out to Homestead and yep. look at all those farms. We have food, we have produce, and so few restaurants are thinking of really interesting ways to use that. And right. that's why you see all these bullshit ass like menu items on these restaurants, like you know the Branzino and the tuna tartare. It's like that's great, but like Branzino, you're I, it's aware. Such, so triggering for me. Branzino. I know. I'm sorry to say that word, but it's just like you know we live next to an ocean, right? And there's like right. a lot of delicious things and local fishermen who catch amazing things, and it's 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 always strikes me. It's just like. We had, I mean, I don't know. I used to, one of my former roommates was a farmer, Chris French, down in French Farms. Oh, and French Farms. Well, I, buy, I buy their stuff through Margie. Yeah, Chris is great. And his, his partner, Tiffany, uh, at um, Little River Co-op is yeah. fantastic, too. And I lived with him for a year, and I watched him get up at 4 a.m., yeah. drive down to Homestead. We lived in Buena Vista at the time, and work his ass off to yep. grow produce. And it was a struggle, you yep. know? He had to fight to sell every single head of lettuce <laughs> Correct. and it's amazing to me that more restaurants aren't doing it i don't it, is it too expensive is it I just mean, yeah, not there's, sexy there's, there's a price attached to it but i always think it's more of a mental thing and i'll tell you that for me as we've grown it's uh become a challenge for me to try to coach my younger chefs how to understand not to manipulate but the farmer you need to communicate with them yeah. You need to communicate with them. Hey, so the eggplant, great. How long is that on the menu? Mm -hmm. Like, how long are you going to grow this? Yeah. What is the, the lifespan of this four months? Cool. So I have this dish for four months. Mm -hmm. It's much, much more work for the chef. Yeah, I imagine. Because it's much easier to say, I'm going to buy arugula from... Uh, fucking a produce company that comes mm -hmm. in a bag that's eleven dollars that will die after thirty six hours in the walk in, than buying arugula that you then need to clean. Then you need to. You, it's more work. Yeah. And not just that. Like, I need to find a place for it. How long is it going to be in season? There's a lot more steps to it. The consistency aspect of it is also a thing. If it rains a lot, if it's too cold, if it there's a lot to it. Get a hurricane or a cold, you know, a cold snap. A hundred percent. There's what it comes down to, honestly, is laziness. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I think that's wrong of me to say. It's not laziness. If you choose to make this decision in your life as a chef to use local produce, and that's not everyone's thing. Everybody wants to be a kitchen. You know, people want to be a kitchen manager. They want to be given recipes. They want to execute. They want to work. They're 10 hours a day, eight hours a day, make their 120 grand a year and they wanna go home and they wanna have their two days off. And then there's the other people that are much more, uh, I guess, I don't know, just like adamant about this. I was adamant about this because this is the way Norman taught me how to cook. I was adamant about this and it got reinforced when I worked for Michael. Mm -hmm. So it was never an option for me. It was never like, I, this, I had no other way of thinking so you know I think for some people they don't want to deal with the stress of it they don't want to deal. they know that they can get a, a box of arugula or a box of gem lettuce or you know a case of beets that are 20 bucks from a produce company that they're getting their beets from another part of the world yeah and it's always gonna be the same beet it's gigantic it doesn't taste like anything and that's what they get mm -hmm. but People still buy it. Yeah. The right thing to do is almost always the hardest thing to do. For sure. <laughs> and it's interesting you say that you learn these things from Norman and Michael, who I have a lot of respect for. And I think there is a wave that they created. You know, one of my favorite new restaurants in Miami is Rosie's. I don't know if you've had a chance to go. Aquino. Aquino. Michael Swartz alumni. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of – the Michael Swartz family tree and the Norman Van Aken family tree is like – they're spread out through Miami now. And there's a lot of them who are trying to do what you're doing and do the right things. And I think the revert – I know it's hard to see this far into the future, especially now. But I think you're going to have that too, the Ariette, you know, ripple effect of the chefs that 
you've preached this to and you've you know just told them the importance of doing this and they buy into that right they're here too what worries me is are they going to have the opportunity to open up their own restaurant it, and this goes actually goes back to the last podcast that you just listened to which was the Zach one yeah um, and we talked a lot about the business side mm-hmm. understanding the business side how to be better prepared for the business side of negotiating of working with landlords of understanding how to raise capital it's like there's a lot of that because again I've been very blessed so like I walked into this situation five years ago and I kind of fumbled around into being very lucky Mm -hmm. you know Um, and then I I learned the very hard way Mm -hmm. because I may have learned how to run a kitchen but I didn't learn how to run a business and I'm fortunate enough that people taught me those things you know so like I think that's that's where affording the opportunity is and when I talk to the the younger side I tell them like you need to learn this side of it and Mm -hmm. I'm I'm willing to teach you because I I know you're not going to be here forever and I want you to leave here and be prepared for the next thing quick story Michael Schwartz a lot of people have opinions about Michael I love Michael very much I think that he's an incredible person. He's done incredible things for me. And when I told him that I was leaving to open up my own restaurant, he said, let's sit down and unpack that. I want you to explain what that means. And I want you to tell me what you think, and then I'm going to tell you what I think, and then I'm going to help you with what you don't know. Mm -hmm. He, He got me a lawyer, pretty much. He did a lot of things for me that a lot of people wouldn't have done. You know, and that's why... For the people that leave here, I always tell them, hey, whatever you need, if you're going to open up your own thing, come talk to us. We can review things with you. This is obviously, we don't want any money. Mm-hmm. We'll help you review things. We'll look over leases. We'll talk to our lawyer. They could do some things for you, like whatever you want. Because going back to your point, other people like the ripple effect, a lot of Norman and Michael people, uh, chefs, front of the house people around the city. The reason why New York and Chicago and the West Coast is what they are is because they've been around for so much longer. Such Period. a young city. We're so young. So the Normans, the Michaels, the Michelles, those people, like, they bred some more, and then now our job is to breed some more. Mm-hmm. And then their job is to breed some more. And that's how you create a food culture that it can be around for a hundred years. Yeah. And that's why we don't need any more Tulum inspired restaurants. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, I do know what you're saying. And what worries me is like, do we, I mean, one thing that was remarkable this year and I wrote a guide about it is like all these sort of, a lot of people lost their jobs this year or temporarily lost their jobs. And we saw a lot of like hospitality people go to their apartments and literally like start these takeout operations, like from their own homes. Like I think of Ben Me, like I had, I ordered their Bon Me one time best bond me i've ever had yeah lil lao started as that too um ori bake shop is like helen kim is running a fantastic bakery out of her kitchen and zitsum as well zitsum Lovely. shout out zitsum and they're opening up a restaurant that's soon. right and it was just here yesterday just such an incredible I, human if all those people could get the opportunity that zitsum is getting i think we're gonna be one of the most exciting dynamic young cities in the world i right. think it's up to and I, you have more insight into this than I do. I don't know the business side of this, but I just really want to plead with like these landlords and developers to like look into their soul and take a chance on these people and give them the benefit of the doubt and give them a good deal. And like Metro One and Thor Equities, whatever the hell they are, like these people buying entire neighborhoods in Miami, like look into your like. Do you need a third boat? Or do you want to actually create something that's cool and that's right. Miami and that's sustainable and that's delicious and fascinating? Like, And that's the struggle that Miami's been fighting for a long time, and not just recently. I think, and I agree with you, but I will add to that, mm-hmm. the person, it takes a certain amount of uh, being uncomfortable to go and open your own operation. Absolutely. It takes so much risk. You you need to be okay with one failure, two, not making as much money as when you go to work for a hotel or another established company Mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. Because, you know, like, you need to sacrifice. Yeah. And, And 
I think the longevity is in the sacrifice. And that's, I always go to like the short con and the long con, right? Like, you know, these people that are opening Tulum inspired restaurants, and we'll just keep on using that term. <laughs> yeah, it's a good catch all for no, the I kind know. of well, restaurant just, we're talking about. It encompasses about. why we're here, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, those people, and, and I go back to Schwartz because he told me this and it stuck with me forever. He was like, when you open up a restaurant, you have two options. You could be a flash in the pan or you could be a hard sear. It's totally up to you. And he's like, you know, those flash in the pans are there. They're hot for six months and then they fucking disappear and they close in 18 months. And that's part of why the culture and the failure rate of restaurants is so high. Or you can build something that's more about ingraining yourself into a community and for the guest and always being there for the guest and understanding that the guest is the most important. They may not, not always be right, but the most important because you want to get them back. And that's that's the thing. Like those those are the things. You need to understand that the long con is the thing. It's not about a short lease. It's about a fucking long lease. Mm-hmm. And it's about a long lease that is good, you know? Yeah. But it's also, I imagine, about your own personal constitution and, like, how much bullshit you can take and oh, kind man. of business decisions and, and all this other stuff, too. I, it's just – and I, I consider myself, again, blessed because I have an incredible partner. His name is Andrew. He's fucking super talented at what he does. Mm-hmm. And he takes – he has taken so many things off of my plate, if you will. The things that I'm not good at, things that I've learned a ton about and that I'm more proficient at, but it's what he does. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are like, I want to own 100% of my business. I'm like, man, you know, sometimes 60% or 70% is better than fucking 0%. And that's the reality of it. Yeah. And I, I've always been a team person. So if a team is on the ownership side or on the cooking side or on the prep side or whatever it may be, it's a team game. And to be successful, you need a team to be successful.